Hey everybody, I'm Jessica. And I'm Josh, welcome to The Branch. I have a sad announcement. What is that? Well, you know, all good things must come to an end. Yes. Our interns are leaving us. Mm. It's so sad. That is but sad. we also love them because we they've done them. such amazing work for us and poured into the next generation mm -hmm. this summer. We put on all of our own camps and without having our interns, oh we would God. not be able to do it. So yeah. we're so glad that they were here. Um, also really sad they're leaving. If you have a chance to see them, Anytime in the next week or so before they leave, make sure and say thank you and wish them luck on whatever's next for them. Uh, we're gonna miss them, but we're so thankful for everything they did for us this summer. And coming up this Wednesday, August 4th, we have a family night of worship. We are really yeah. pumped about this. Uh, we are taking all of the songs that we've done at all the camps and we're gonna be singing those together. This is going to be a night of worship. I mean, do you remember what it felt like going to camps? Yeah. And, you know, and I mean, yeah. so it's gonna be that feeling. Yes. Um, but all of us together, and it's gonna be really cool. You are not going to want to miss it, so make sure you're there this Wednesday, August 4th. Yeah, I'm so excited for that. If you are ready to get serious about your finances, we have a class for you. Financial Peace University is beginning August 15th at our Farmers Branch campus. Uh, it's a class all about helping you manage your money. Uh, and if you want to join that class, go to our app and you can sign up. It will cost a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but if you attend nine classes, we will reimburse that fully. So, cool. yeah, you do not want to miss that class. It's going to be awesome. And also, at the end of this month, at the end of August, we are going to have Baby Blessing at both campuses. Baby Blessing is our chance as a staff and as a congregation to come alongside those who have had babies in the past year or so and just say, hey, we love you, we love your child, and we want to be with you and partner with you in discipling your child. So that's what Baby Blessing is. It's, it's our chance to be able to communicate those things to you. So if you have a baby and you want to participate in that, go to the Branch app and you can register for either campus right there. And on our app, you can also pull up sermon notes, which yep. you're going to need today for Chris's sermon. We are finishing up Hebrews chapter 11. Again, it's great to be with you and welcome to the Branch. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Grace runs 
You know, some of the greatest stories that have emerged out of the Olympics in the recent decades are actually the stories that emerge out of the Paralympics that run concurrently to the Olympics. Uh, And there's one Paralympian who has emerged in recent years. He's a blind sprinter by the name of David Brown. He's the world record holder right now for the 100 meters. And one of the coolest things about the 100 meter sprint for David Brown is that each competitor has a tandem sprinter that they're tethered to. And if you can imagine the tandem sprinter for a world-class sprinter who's blind can't just be anybody. I mean, like Like you and me couldn't be a tandem sprinter, let's put it that way. I mean, as my high school football coach likes to say, Seedman, he's small, but he's slow. Okay, so so it couldn't be just anybody, but he's got a tandem sprinting buddy by the name of Jerome Avery, who himself was an aspiring Olympic sprinter for many, many years. He never made it to the finals of the Olympics, but nevertheless, he became a professional sprinter and is world-class in his own right. In fact, to give you an idea of how they work together, here's a clip from the recent world championships in London with the two of them are working together. It's about three and a half minutes. Check this out right now. Lucas Prado of Brazil from four years ago holds the championship record. Look out for that mark, 11.08. David Brown believes he is in with a very, very good chance indeed of taking the championship record to go with that world record. Perhaps we might see both fall. On the outside, Lex Gillette with Mason Rhodes. Going from seven. The Namibian Ananasia Congo silver medalist in the Paralympics will go from five, Brown in three, and Di Dong Dong of China in one. And obviously with the guy they're given space with only four maximum competing in this. This time they're away and Brown gets away very, very well indeed in lane three. Himself and Jerome Avery, D Dong Dong on the inside, but it's David Brown who's going across the line in first place. It's Brown who gets there 11.21, so he doesn't break the championship or world record, but it is that man who gets across David Brown and takes first place with Jerome Avery. He got out rather quickly indeed. He held his form as they came towards the finishing line. And there he is, the winner, the world champion, our Paralympic champion. He holds the world record, David Brown. He takes the gold medal in the men's 100 metres, T11. A decent running day for this alone. What a fabulous race. Uh, big congratulations to both of the athletes. Also, congratulations for the silver and bronze medalists. Great race. And Anaya Shikongo with a season best for him, finishes in second place. And Di Dong Dong, bronze in 2015. And he's picked up third place again at these championships in London 2017. But there he is, what a man indeed. An athlete of world class, David Brown. With a stretch there at the end to get across in front of his guy, which you have to do. And he takes third place from Lex Gillette who was finishing hard and fast out wide. David Brown there, tethered to his guide. Jerome Avery, looking all the part, the class athlete that he is. Communication from Avery to Brown, and he'll let him go just before the line to cross ahead of himself, just there. Synchronization, practice, and training does that. There are so many things that you can just draw from. There are so many things that you can draw from that story of David Brown and Jerome Avery. For one, David is just an inspiration in terms of just not allowing your limitations to get the best of you, amen, and just seeing what he does. But Jerome Avery is an inspiration on a couple levels. One is the fact that here's a guy that never achieved his own dream for for an Olympic medal, and yet 
he had to deal with the disappointment of that as a result. And yet, the last few years, he's been finding incredible joy in helping David achieve his dream. Another thing that's noteworthy is Jerome's humility. Did you notice how he was just pointing to David after David won? He wanted David to get all the attention, wraps him in the American flag. Did you notice in the slow-mo how Jerome is talking to David while they're running? First of all, that's impressive. I would be like dying running, you know. But he's, and to hear him mouth the words, go, David, go. And you could just see him talking David through a 100-meter sprint. And it was cool. You had to look at it a couple of times. You could see them tethered the whole way. They're attached at the wrist together. All this to say, there is just something beautiful about having someone to run with, particularly in the journey of faith. And that's one of the reasons why you have a a, a passage like you have in Hebrews chapter 11, because the Lord knows you and I need people to run with. We need people in the flesh to run with in our daily lives. We need people, even in Scripture, to run with and to be tethered to in our hearts on this journey as examples of faith. And we've been walking through... uh, some stories and, and the lives of some people who can help us run our own races. They were lives distinguished by faith. Today we come to the close of this tour through the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to close it by visiting a part of the hall that a lot of people skip. It's the last part of the hall. Picking up in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Let's just stop and breathe here for a second. Here the writer is just opening up the fire hose. He's been telling you a story here and a story there and then having several sentences of commentary for each person. But now he's out of patience. And and the writer gets to the end and he just opens up the fire hose. He's ready to wrap it up. And so he just starts firing names at you. Every one of these names have stories that go with them in the narrative of the Old Testament. And it's just story after story of what I would call breakthrough experiences. These are experiences where people are having tremendous adversity, tremendous challenges, and yet there's a breakthrough of some kind. And the writer speaks of it happening through faith. You might say, what is faith? The very first verse of our passage we looked at the beginning of the summer tells you faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. So in this section, the writer is reminding you of people who were confident in what they hoped for. They were assured of what they didn't yet see. And they prayed or they took some kind of action of some kind. In a couple cases, maybe they waited, and that was hard to do. And they experienced a breakthrough. Here's what he's saying. Through their faith... Kingdoms were conquered. Justice was administered. Through their faith, they gained what was promised. Through their faith, they escaped the edge of the sword. Through their faith, weakness was turned to strength. Through their faith, armies were routed in battle. Women even received back to life those who had been dead. And it's just one breakthrough piled on top of another in this section. But then you get to the second half of verse 35 and the vibe changes. Verse 35, there were others, everybody say, "Uh uh-oh, yeah, you don't want to be in this section. You don't want to be the others in one sense. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. 
They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Now, whereas the first section contains these examples of what I would call breakthrough experiences, breakthrough faith, this second section contains examples of what I would call enduring faith. To put it another way, verses 32 through 35 tell the stories of the great things that happen through faith. Verses 35 through 38 tell the stories of the hard things people went through because of their faith. Hard things here in the text isn't necessarily just adversity you encounter as part of life in this fallen world. It's, he's not really talking about sickness or things going wrong or things just falling apart, although there are great examples to us of people who endure such things in faith that are worthy of celebrating and recognizing. All of these things had to do with enduring things that other human beings were doing to people of faith because of their particular convictions. Some were tortured, some faced jeers, some were flogged, some were in chains, some were in prison, some were stoned, some were sawed in two, some were killed by the sword, some had nothing to wear but animal skins, they were destitute, they were persecuted, they were mistreated, they wandered about in deserts, mountains, caves, and holes in the ground. Now, I have little doubt that all those people look to God for a breakthrough of some kind in their circumstances. But the breakthrough in these contexts didn't come. We're not yet to the end of the passage. I'm not going to waste any time with you. I'm diving in and just give you the first application here. The journey of faith involves both breakthrough, breakthrough faith and enduring faith. The journey of faith involves both breakthrough faith and enduring faith. The reason it's important to hold on to this and to embrace this tension is because sometimes believers and churches tend to build their belief systems around one or the other. For some, the journey of faith is only about the breakthrough, and it's all about the breakthrough. If you're not breaking through whatever challenge, whatever obstacle, whatever difficulty, then you're not operating in faith and something is wrong with your faith. And so consequently, if you're in the life of a church that tends to operate more around that orientation, when you go through a season where there is no breakthrough and you are enduring, sometimes when you're enduring, sometimes you begin to feel like there's no place for you to belong there, or even share your frustration or your weariness or your questions. On the other hand, there are believers in churches that they're only and all about enduring. That, that truly praying or taking steps in faith for breakthrough is seen as shallow by them. It's seen as out of touch with the reality or gravity of the situation you're facing. In fact, you're only setting yourself up for more disappointment. There's a line of counsel out there, even among pastors today, about being careful not to pray too big. Because you don't want to set people up for disappointment. And so praying big prayers for a change or a breakthrough is almost embarrassing in some of these cultures or communities. Even more than that, any story somebody tells of a breakthrough is looked upon with cynicism or is hyper-critiqued or met with, surely there must be another explanation. The reality is the journey of faith will include both in our lives experiences of breakthrough and seasons of endurance. This was true for Jesus himself. That's who we're following. Think about Jesus himself. There are many stories of him experiencing breakthrough and bringing breakthrough into other people's lives. That's the essence of the miracle stories. But then in Hebrews, since we're here, it's worth remembering how chapter 12 begins when you're called to fix your eyes on Jesus and you're called to remember that he endured the cross. 
And then we're called to consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. One of my desires for us as a church is that we can be the kind of community of disciples that acknowledges both breakthrough faith and enduring faith, where we can give space in our gatherings be there our worship services or our small group gatherings where we can give space in our gatherings or in our student ministry, in our kids' ministry, or at home if, we, if we're worshiping at home right now with a group of people. One of my hearts is that we can be the kind of gathering where you can unapologetically pray boldly for breakthrough and give testimony to it and celebrate it when it happens. And yet at the same time, we can give space in the very same gathering to acknowledge what we are enduring, to acknowledge what we're not yet seeing, to acknowledge it and pray about it and lament it. And by the way, even celebrate and commend those of you who are enduring in faith right now that have no breakthrough. We need both kinds of stories in this journey. Since we're in the season of the Olympics right now, and we're talking about the importance of stories, I think of two stories right out of the world of the sports world that I think about that are stories of breakthrough that are told and stories of endurance. I, I think about England's Roger Bannister in 1954. He was the first person to ever run a mile in less than four minutes. People have been trying to do it on record competitively for about 100 years. Then Bannister finally broke through that barrier in 1954. Within 46 days, a runner from Australia did it. And within a year, three more did it. And since then, more than 1,000 runners have. I'm one of those runners. No, I'm lying to you. But since then, more than 1,000 runners have done this. There's something about a breakthrough that inspires others. There's something about it. A lot of you know the story of David killing the giant Goliath, but nobody reads past to the end of 1 Samuel. If you get to the end of the narrative about David in Samuel and Chronicles, you find out that after he kills Goliath, those who watched David, some of David's own men, wound up killing other giants from Goliath's hometown of Gath. That David's giant killing opened the door for breakthrough for other giants to be slayed. There's something too, telling the story, seeing the breakthrough, praying for the breakthrough. David was there, Roger Bannister. When I think about endurance, I think of another runner by the name of John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania. He didn't win his race. He fell in the 19th mile of the 1968 marathon in Mexico City in the Olympics, lacerated his thigh, could barely walk. He basically walked the last 7.2 miles. They bandaged him up on the 22nd mile. He hobbled his way. He entered into the Coliseum in Mexico City one hour after the next to last runner finished. And as people became aware of what was going on, they strung up a makeshift finish line for John Stephen Aquari to cross an hour after the next to last guy crossed the line while other field events were going on. Later, the American press asked John Stephen Aquari, why did he even bother to finish the race if he knew he was going to finish last? And he had this epic line where he said, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. I think about that often when I'm in a stretch of enduring faith, and I can think of many people among us in the life of our church who are great examples of that kind of enduring faith. We need both stories for the faith journey. We need stories of breakthrough. We need stories of endurance. We need people who are examples of both in our lives that we can tether ourselves to. But if we're going to have them, we have to be the kind of church culture that can live with the tension and that can embrace the tension, that can pray for breakthrough and also celebrate endurance. And I believe that we're to be the kind of people where we can press in in faith for breakthroughs and yet at the very same time where we can also press on in faith and endurance. Let's continue with the passage. It's so important. Verse 39, the writer continues, these were all commended for their faith. Who are the these he's talking about? He's talking about the ones he was just talking about. Both the people who through faith experienced a breakthrough and both the people 
who had enduring faith, they were all commended, which leads me to the second thing, very important. Faith is attested to by the beholder more than the outcome. Faith is attested to by the beholder, God, more than the outcome. The writer says these were all commended for their faith. The ones who had breakthroughs, the ones who didn't. There are times when you experience the breakthrough you're praying for, that you're taking steps for in faith. And there are times when you won't. Not every story ends like David and Goliath. But just because there's not a breakthrough doesn't mean there wasn't faith. Faith is not attested to by the outcome. Faith is in the eye of the beholder. God's commendation for your faith and outcomes are two different things. God commends both faith that was there for the breakthrough and faith that is there when there is no breakthrough. The question is, will he find me pressing in in faith for breakthrough when I face the challenge and obstacle, and will he find me pressing on, enduring in faith when there has yet to be a breakthrough or when there is no breakthrough? I've always loved what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. The king of Babylon threatens to throw him in the furnace if they don't start bowing down to the idol that's been made of him, if they don't start stop, if they don't start ceasing to pray to their God And they say that epic line, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, (laughs) we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. There are times when enduring faith is an expression of even if faith. And every single one of us in our life will have opportunities for even if faith. And by the way, if you remember the story from Daniel 3, sometimes other people are brought into the light of who God is through you turning and facing the heat. Because what happens with Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar the king winds up being brought into the light of the reality of God through their willingness to endure the heat. Which brings me to the next application. Our journey of faith is far more than about us. Let's finish this passage out, verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What in the world is he talking about here? None of them received what had been promised. First of all, you want to go to the writer? That's not true because you said you're you're a lousy writer of an English paper. Well, of course he is. He's writing in Greek, but we'll talk about that some other time. He's contradicting himself. Because earlier he talks about Abraham receiving the promised child, Isaac. We were reminded of some stories earlier where they did get some promises fulfilled. Yeah, but on the other hand, Abraham didn't see in his lifetime the fulfillment of everything that God promised him. That's what the writer's talking about. He was promised his descendants would be like sand on the seashore and that all all the nations on the earth would be blessed through him. Abraham didn't live to see either of those, at least in the earthly realm. He didn't live to see all those promises come to pass in his lifetime. Why? Abraham's journey wasn't all about Abraham. This is true for all the people of faith mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Every one of the stories that we've been through play a piece in the puzzle of God's salvation plan through Jesus, which unfolds over thousands of years and through many different families and locations. And so God moving his people from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan wasn't just about blessing his people with their own land. It was also about getting his people in position geographically for the Messiah to come out of them centuries later. God moved in their lives in such a way that he longed to bless them, but his purposes transcended them because it was more than just about them. And God moves in your life and brings blessing to you, but his purposes also transcend you. It turns out that so many of the stories in the Old Testament that you think mean one thing come to mean something entirely different once Jesus comes on the scene and does what he does. 
You read the stories of the Old Testament in a whole new light after Jesus comes on the scene. For example, take the story of Abraham and his son named Isaac on Mount Moriah in Genesis 2. You read it thinking it means one thing, but then you begin to think of it differently after you come to understand the story of the father and son on a cross at Golgotha, which, by the way, is in the same general area as Mount Moriah thousands of years later. Or take the little town of Bethlehem. It first appears in Genesis, early in Genesis. You know what it means? House of bread. For thousands of years, it means house of bread. And wouldn't you know it? The house of bread is the place where the bread of life is born and the bread of life rises. But it wasn't until Jesus came along that the meaning of the town of Bethlehem was brought into a whole new light. You read weird stories of the Old Testament about a king named Rehoboam whose biggest contribution to Bethlehem was he won it back and then he fortified it in such a way that it survived until the days of Jesus and even until today so that Jesus could be born in it. That's Rehoboam's contribution to Bethlehem. I go on and on. You read the Old Testament story of Ruth whose life is saved by a redeemer who's from where? Bethlehem. Where does your redeemer come out of? Bethlehem. Everything that happens before Jesus of the Old Testament suddenly is seen in a new light after Jesus comes along. Turns out that everybody's faith journey wasn't just about their faith. It wasn't just about their circumstances. It wasn't just about their time. We're all running a lay, a relay. We're all running our part. And we all run it well in faith. And by the way, we have all we can handle at the moment. We're just to be faithful with our part, with our lap. But there are others who've come before us, and there are others to come after us. And so when we experience breakthroughs, we thank God, we celebrate, we testify. And when we don't, we endure knowing our faith journey is more than just about us. But for those of us who are in a stretch right now of enduring, I want to highlight some suggestions rooted in Hebrews 11 if you're in a stretch of enduring, and this is where I want to close. When we're in a stretch of enduring, let's seek him more than the desired outcome. Here's why I say that. Verse 6 of Hebrews 11 says, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Sometimes I'm guilty of seeking a particular outcome more than him. And when the outcome doesn't happen, my faith can be rocked. If you're grieving an outcome that has yet to happen or perhaps won't happen, seek him. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. He rewards those who earnestly seek him, not the outcome. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. And in most cases, it takes an outcome being delayed or not even ever coming sometimes in order for me to really start seeking him. If you're tired of running the race and the outcomes you've been praying for haven't come to pass, the outcomes you've been taking steps in faith for don't seem to be coming to pass, it's good to ask the Lord, Lord, show me where you are in this. I'm seeking you. Secondly, let's stay mindful of the country we represent and are headed for. Just a few verses after Hebrews eleven six, 6, we read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob picking up in verse 13. Check this out. All these people were still living by faith when they died. And that's something you're always going to be called to live by faith, even to your last minute. Even your last minute. All these people were still living by faith when they died. You will see the faithfulness of God, yes, in your lifetime, but there will always be something you're leaning into in faith. Even until your last breath. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. Jump down to verse 16. Instead, they are longing 
for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You know, I've, I have found that the times I tend to think about heaven the most tend to correspond with the times of my life when the outcomes on this planet are less than I desire. <laughs> Even Jesus himself focused on heaven when he was going through hell. Again, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Even Jesus had to live this way, remembering the country he was from and where he was headed. I love how C.S. Lewis put it. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians... It is since that Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. And then finally, I would say, let's remember we're not alone. The very first verse of Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, in light of everything that I've been saying previously on your tour, we're at the end of your tour. I'm at the other end of the hall of faith as you're exiting. The tour guide says, therefore. What's this therefore? He's about to tell you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are those witnesses? They're the ones you've just seen on your tour through Hebrews chapter 11. You're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. They're onlookers. They've been where you are. By the way, you want to know something that just blows my mind if you read over to the end of chapter 12 this is all for free it's not in my notes right now so the slide people don't need to get nervous if you get over to the end of chapter 12 he starts talking about the mountain that you come to in worship you ought to read it closely he starts coming to he, he talks to you about when you're worshiping you're coming to a mount where there are thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly and then he says this you're also coming to a mount well, there are the spirits of people who've already been redeemed by the new covenant. That when you gather for worship, there's more than just you in the room. There's, you're entering into a realm of angels. You're also entering into a realm where there are the spirits of people who are saved that have already passed. They're in that realm too. Great cloud of witnesses. But even more than all of this, you have Jesus, who, by the way, he has the scars to prove that he knows the journey. And so you fix your eyes on Jesus. When my son Skyler was in the hospital for the summer of 2010 with bacterial meningitis and MRSA, you know the one thing he requested over and over of the sweet things that so many people gave him, the one thing that he requested over and over, as an 11-year-old little boy, he wanted this simple little silver cross that somebody had given him. And I remember asking him deep into the journey, after he had been in that hospital for 31 days as an 11 year old lost all of his skin terrible suffering a tube in his chest I remember asking him why do you hold on to the cross and in his 11 year old way of conveying he said I hold on to it because I know that Jesus felt pain that's all he said but it had something to do with him enduring. I'll tell you what, even kids can get a hold of this. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a follower of Jesus and a Russian writer. His works are classics. They're read all over the world. You're made to read his works in college whether you want to or not. But while he had incredible breakthroughs as a writer, much of his life was marked by enduring faith. He spent years in a Siberian prison. At one point, he became so completely discouraged, he decided he was going to end his life, and he knew how he could do it. 
He decided he was going to go work out in the field, which is what he did seven days a week, only he was going to get out there in the open and just stop digging, just stop working, and just lean on his shovel. He knew it would be only a matter of time for the guards would come out and start beating him, and he would just allow them to beat him until he was unconscious. They could just beat him to death. He had decided he was going to do it, but there was another prisoner who knew that look in his eye. And Solzhenitsyn's trying to work by himself, and this prisoner stays right by him the whole time. And it's driving Alexander nuts. And he finally, that prisoner notices Alexander just stops working. He stops getting away from the guy. He just stops working, and he starts to lean on his sho shovel. And that fellow prisoner knew what he was doing. And as the guards began to make their way to that part of the field where Solzhenitsyn was, his fellow prisoner took his own shovel and drew a massive cross in the sand right in front of Alexander. And Alexander saw that cross and picked up his shovel and started digging again. He later wrote, a decade later, that his entire being was renewed out in that field by the sight of the cross etched in the dirt that that simple moment where that prisoner interceded for him called him back to fix his eyes on Jesus and to remember he was not alone. And that's the reason the world has the books they have from him today is because he refused to take his life strengthened by fixing his eyes on Jesus. Jesus calls us to this race of faith. Every one of us, some of you are thinking, I'm, I'm not qualified to run the race. i got good news for you. He's, he gives us all his uniform, his uniform of righteousness. And he gives us his spirit to give us air for the journey. And we've got witnesses in the clouds. We've got teammates around us in this church. And it's time to run the race marked out for us. And you know what? It's going to be a race marked by experiences of breakthrough. And it will be a race marked by stretches of endurance. But I'm telling you, at the finish line, for every single one of us, there's going to be a commendation that will truly be out of this world. Out of this world. So I'm going to ask you to take what you have for communion. And I'm going to step out of the way and you'll find a couple questions to ponder so we take communion together. Pray with me, Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your presence. I pray that you would show us how to be a people that holds on to both of these things. How to be a people who endure in faith. These are your stories, stories that you tell, Lord examples that we have but we also are people who are fearless about praying big and taking concrete steps for breakthrough we know you commend all the breakthrough faith the enduring faith and we thank you for Jesus who endured for it's because of him we can even have an opportunity to enter the race and to run well and to finish strong. We thank you for him through Jesus.
riches of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story.
You are calling us to lead them back to you. We will see your spirit rising as the lost come out of hiding. Every heart will see this hope we have in you. Oh, for all the sons and daughters who are walking in the darkness, you are calling us to lead them back to you. We will see your spirit rising as the lost come out of hiding. Every heart will see this hope we have in you. Thanks for being here today. It was great to be with you. As we close, we want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer with people that you've gathered with or by yourself, just discerning what the Lord might have for you today and this coming week. And as always, please like, comment, share the videos. Um, that is what helps get this message out and the gospel out to more and more people. And that's what we are here for. We're so glad that you are here with us today and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.